This conference will now be recorded. All right, you guys, I think I'm going to go ahead. We're all ready. It is 6.33. I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. And if everyone could just please uh, join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Jesse's going to sing the national anthem. <laughs> that would be cool. That would be cool. She's using um, practice for that. All right. So, Jess, can you give me a hand with the roll call, please? Yes, Planning Commissioner Elkosherry. Present. Planning Commissioner Smith. Uh, excused. Planning Commissioner Hill. Here. Planning Commissioner Nutbrock. Here. Planning Commissioner Keeler. Here. And Planning Commissioner Jones. Here. Thank you very much. And uh, at this time, I would entertain a motion for approval of the last meeting minutes. That was March 14th. They've been published for quite a bit. So moved. Second. All right. We have a uh, motion on the table, and it's uh, been motioned and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Okay. Uh, if there are no objections, we'll just use unanimous consent to approve the meeting minutes. Any objections? All right. Hearing no objections, the March 14th uh, meeting minutes are approved. And I think, Jess, we may have had one submission for comment. And also we is, can... Oh, sorry. Is we... that my time to talk now? There we go. Uh, yes, if, uh, if you have a public comment, um, please go ahead. Um, it's important to include your name, your address, and then your comment. Betcha. Yeah, my name is Lane Johnston, and I, uh, well, I currently live in Battleground, but I'm looking at doing a project out there and kind of going through the code. Um, I guess my comment was that the MDR code, there's some conflicting code in there with the, uh, with the densities and the, the clusters, I guess. Um, I was just kind of wanted to make a motion there to see if the city would sponsor a code amendment on the MDR code to fix it where it conflicts. Do you have any other, um, you actually wouldn't have, happen to have the code, like the actual municipal code number, would you? Yeah, I do, it is. Um, put you on the spot. Oh, no, that's okay. I do have it. I wasn't very clear there, so just give me a second. Okay. So the code number I'm uh, in reference, referring to is section 18.140.060. And in there, there's that section that says multifamily attached housing shall not be permitted in clusters of greater than 10 dwelling units, but it kind of conflicts with the uh, the density where it talks about it. Uh, the, the table that refers to there being the possibility to put 8 to 14 units in there per acre. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you for your comment. We'll, uh, well, if that's sorry. clear enough or not. Appreciate the comment. Is that something we're going to refer to Ethan to respond to? I think we can just discuss that offline when we, when we have some time. I think there's a lot of revisions we're looking at in our code and And, and we are recording, I'm assuming. That's one that we know about, and we've met with Mr. Johnson. Um, and so the issue is specifically 
for multifamily um, when you have a limitation of only being able to build 10 units per cluster, um, which we're interpreting as per building because there's no definition of cluster, that you can't hit the minimum, you can't hit the, the maximum density allowed in that zone. So it's effectively like another ceiling on density there. And so that's what that's what he's referencing. Is that something we can fix? Uh, yes, and that's why he's bringing this forward to you because um, he's wanting a solution to that issue. And, and so we met with him and suggested that he provide a public comment um, to the Planning Commission to kick this process off. And then, um, you know, assuming you agree, we would look into that issue and then start bringing some code, revised code forward to you. And, and we've already exceeded that significantly. Uh, sorry, what was, I couldn't. Well, the city has already allowed the Riverside Apartments, which are 24 units per building. So we've already let that happen. But did they have some variance on that? No. Is this uh, is this a long term fix? Um, you mean will it take a long time? Or yeah. I don't think it would actually take too long to do a few months of work on that with the planning commission and then go to city council. So maybe two, three, perhaps four months at the most. Is that total into his schedule? Um, I'll let him answer that question if he if he wants to, but um, he's he's aware that it will take that long. Okay, that's what I wanted. Okay, thank you. I think the key is we add this to the list of all the rework we're doing, and mm -hmm. perhaps we can. And that one that one is on the list. Okay, perfect. And we can bump it up or something. All right, excellent. We well, appreciate the public comment. Um, I don't think there's anyone else on the. Virtual meeting. Uh, did we have any comments come in through email or voicemail or fax? <laughs> <You're a good. laughs> All right. All right. So I'm going to go ahead okay, and thank you. Close. Guys. Yes. Thank you for the comment. Uh, and we have no public hearing this month, although we're getting ready to have one on some of the changes we've made. But for this month, I think we're good. And so we'll just roll into 1.7.1, uh, unfinished business. Uh, Ethan, I'll hand that off to you or Alec or Brian. <laughs> Jess, am I on? Oh, I can hear myself. Perfect. <laughs> it's working well. Yes. Um, so uh, we're tackling the um, work plan and schedule for the comprehensive plan periodic update um, per our last meeting uh, in April with the planning commission. Yes, it's on. Um, anyways, um, the uh, last planning commission meeting, um, the commission requested that we provide you, you all a update on the work plan and schedule. Um, so we uh, went ahead and went through and made some updates. So I was going to go ahead and give a general overview of um, what updates we did throughout that. Um, the last time we provided this update was at the joint workshop with the Planning Commission and City Council back in February. Um, so it's good time, uh, good to um, touch base on this as we go through this process. Um, so the first of these uh, changes is um, we've added phase one had tasks four tasks initially. Um, now there are five tasks. Um, task two, the county coordination meetings, was a subtask in task one. But as we um, were going through the schedule and the work plan and um, kind of tweaking things, um, it kind of stands alone as its own task, as it's in, rela in relation to everything else. Um, and so we just um, moved that into its own task. And then every other subs subsequent task after that is task three, four, and five. Um, and so um, we're having those county coordination meetings monthly. Um, we just had one last week. Um, with the county and all the cities in the county. Um, and they're currently discussing um, the population projections and essentially how these numbers were determined by the Washington State um, Office of Financial Management or OFM. Um, and then 
basically at that meeting, it's just an overview of those numbers and how historically the middle OFM projections. Um, I believe in January, um, we provided um, some population projections that OFM provided at the county level. And there's the low, medium, and high projections. And um, at this meeting last week, um, the county staff were discussing about how the middle OFM projection has historically been accurate predicting growth. So kind of hinting that maybe we should stick around that middle projection. Um, but that will be determined actually next Tuesday, April 18th, at the county council hearing. Um, they're actually going to be selecting a projection um, next Tuesday. Um, so that will have pretty large implications on countywide planning and the city's planning um, for population projections and allocations and so on and so forth. So, the, so they decide on a county number. Do they also decide on the municipalities also? They will. Um, that will be going on later this year. Um, and I'll go more in detail on that with the work plan because we made some updates based off of the information they provided the, us. Um, yes. Alec, what is the uh, level of participation? Are you satisfied? Or, I don't know if you're satisfied, but uh, are we getting good participation here through in the county on this, on this uh, meetings? Yeah, from the city level, yeah. staff level, yes. Um, uh, either Ethan, Brian, or myself, um, two of us three are usually there are at those the, meetings. Not only just us, but are we are you, other cities? Other cities, yes. Are they all engaged as well? Yes, yeah, we're all very engaged. Um, okay. There's a representative from every city there at every meeting, um, sometimes multiple. Okay, thanks. Yes. And I'll just chime in there. Um, the cities have jointly prepared a letter to the county um, supporting that mid-growth option. Um, so that's something that we're that the city of Vancouver helped lead the effort on, and we'll have our mayor pro tem sign that along with mayors from other cities throughout the county. Thank you. Any other questions before I move on on this topic? Okay. Um, so our next update. Um, this one's pretty minor. Um, we're uh, phase one, task three, the audit task. Um, we did add. Um, the complete commerce, commerce critical areas checklist. Um, we did add update in April 2023, which is what Ethan will be doing. Next is providing an update on the critical areas ordinance based upon the audit we performed on the checklist. Um, I believe we introduced that to you on, in December or January this past year or early this year. Um, and so we'll be diving back into that again and getting ready for code updates for that. So that was the minor adjustment we made there, just adding that update for this month on that task. And then um, next is phase one, task four, public involvement. Um, again, the joint work session we had in February, um, city council provided some comments on the public involvement and participation, or public involvement and communications plan, the PICP. Um, and so we're providing an update to city council in May on the PICP. Um, they provide a comment um, one of the comments I remember is uh, um, tabling at existing city events and just using opportunities to engage with the public without having to um, expand the process and maybe the budget um, to um, hold different events to engage the public on the comprehensive plan update process. So we're updating the PACP to reflect that comment. Um, so like the city Christmas tree lighting form. Uh, <laughs> So, for example, the city Christmas tree lighting ceremony, like table event like that, and it's an easy, passive way to engage with the public about this topic and um, maybe um, reach to people that maybe wouldn't be reached in other other ways of outreach. I guess a, sort of a side question: outreach. How successful was the Parks and Open Plan outreach? Was that is that a good form to use for this kind of thing? Yes. Oh, <laughs> I I haven't seen the results of that yet. It just closed um, end of last week, I think it was, and I was out of town when it closed, and I haven't seen the digest come across my desk yet um, on how much participation we got. The uh, survey that we did initially for the parks plan, we had a pretty decent response on, I think about 200 responses, which was um, substantial, we thought, based on the, the method that we used, um, but we'll see. 
we'll see how much we'll, participation yeah, we got. See how effective that kind of online house can be for. And if we hold something, <clears throat> something, uh, an event here uh, in the city, um, are you anticipating we would have some kind of a pop-up tent and maybe a table, a couple of commissioners or someone manning that with um, some kind of a questionnaire or something that would prompt them to ask questions and such is, is who's kind of has the lead on that if that's a, a, an approach <clears throat> um typically a tabling event would be at um you know a community event like our days or something like that or the christmas tree lighting and i think that those were maybe mentioned at the city council meeting and so we would set up at those events and people could drop in um you know as they're available or curious and interested and then we would talk to them about that um at those at those venues and so you know if you have other ideas for venues um then then let us know but i think maybe those two were kind of the main two ones off the top of my head that that got mentioned i was, I was thinking uh, uh, also on the lines of what would be the uh, the material that would be used or uh, or available to the public would we be passing out something or would we just be trying to answer questions or what would be the, what would be the prompt to the to the public who walks up to the to the table and sees the sign that says I'm not sure what the sign even says <laughs> uh, but it, it invites them to participate or make comments something that would be yeah. a starter it would be a combination of all of those things and so we would typically have a board or two a graphic board or two you know that would say something about the comprehensive plan and invite their comment and we could have a comment box with some forms right there um you know and then we could potentially have some you know like a one page fact sheet that we can hand out to them they can go to the city's website for further information on the comprehensive plan update contact information as well on that on that fact sheet um you know so that's generally kind of what it what it would be well the thing that comes to my mind and we well, a number of years ago we did something but i i thought if we had um when they came up um we'll say that these these are the top you know we, we we'd like your input on these top five items or top 10 items can you get to give us your thoughts on and some you know some items that we we, we throw at them you know mm -hmm. that they can respond to that we can then have uh, so that they're not just coming up and just asking anything but if they respond to those questions then we can keep track of what their responses are for those like do we get the you know was it a, we get a nine a, three on that or a nine on that or whatever interest and and accumulate that at the end and maybe get something out of it that says okay mm -hmm. there's a hundred of people who are talking they're wanting this or this or that or comments and so on so i think that could be really well done would you ethan be then the, the key person then to um, maybe not necessarily wsp has a public involvement team and so when i when I need those services, I go talk to them, and they're experts in putting together those graphics and sort of brain, brainstorming what we should be asking people and what you know to to be most effective. I mean, I like your idea of, of prompting them with some questions. Um, so I might attend one or two of those events, um, but it might also be somebody else that's. Um, that's on the public involvement team that could um uh that that's used to doing those sort of things i'm I'm used to doing it as well but that that could also provide that support well i think that we you know would be important for one of one or more of the commissioners to be you know there where they're asking us questions and so on and getting gathering information so on I was also just wondering, and I don't know if it's appropriate, but um, those are kind of big things. But I know during the summer there's a farmer's market as well as the the concerts and Sturgeon Miller Park. Um, just wondering if, if 
that those yeah. as well might be a, a place just to have a presence. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think we were talking about a possible working group or working session of like the outreach folks and, and maybe whoever ends up being part of that group could, you know, spearhead being, you know, one of the faces. Um, it, it's kind of an area of interest for me. And I also work in town. Well, I work from home, so I work in town. So I, I wouldn't mind showing up to some of those events. Just throw it out there. Myself as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so we can um, update the PICP and and include those comments as well. Um, the point of a PICP, the public involvement communication plan, is to be a living document and to evolve over time as we go through this process. So again, we'll probably next couple of years keep it evolving and updating it and then um, reflecting that through that and the work plan and the schedule. It's all it's all tethered. So we appreciate the comments on that. Thanks. Um, and then next for the work plan update is task five in phase one. Um, so based upon that um, April 18th hearing for pop population projections that um, the city or the county council will be choosing um, this next Tuesday, um, we added a second uh, planning commission discussion on the population projections uh, for May this year after that hearing to provide an update of um, the projection that was selected and um, the implications of that that we'll be seeing um, throughout the county and uh, all the cities, including the center. Um, so we added that to the work plan and the schedule. Um, and then uh, we updated the work plan um, for the county population and employment allocations. Um, as the county has been going through this process, they've been updating the schedule and updating us on that. So we've updated the work plan to reflect that. So. Um, we'll be coordinating with the county once they choose that population projection from May through September. And then um, in the fall of this year, um, they'll be selecting the final population and employment allocations for each of the cities in the county. Um, and so we'll be closely working with the county through those coordination meetings and, um, and other means as we go through this process. And then um, once we get closer to those dates, we can give you more details about um, the hearings to select because those, those uh, the employment and final population allocations will actually be selected by the county council as well. And so um, they'll have hearings for, for that um, through the fall. Um, it's looking like uh, October 2023, it should be all done, um, but that's tentative. So it's, it's subject to change and it could be multiple hearings. Um, so we updated the work plan for that. Um, and then, yes, go ahead. Um, more for my education. I understand population and can, they can project that, but the employment allocation, what does that mean? I mean, is, do they allocate how much, how many people are employed within the city limits? Yeah, they um, can, it's kind of a rough estimate, um, but by industrial and commercial lands, they divide employment lands by that. So um, based upon the 2015 comprehensive plan and um, they assigned like nine jobs per acre for industrial lands and then 20 jobs per acre for commercial lands. And um, they determine, um, it's a little, it's not as concrete as population projections and allocations. Um, from my understanding, they have a general, it's like a, I'll have to have Ethan's help, but I know um, that they have a, the nine for industrial and 20 for commercial, um, but Ethan could probably have, provide a better assist where they get the actual number to attain that rate. So after they select a population projection, then they provide that to the Washington um, employment Services Division, um, ESD, and they come up with an employment projection for the whole county, um, similar or analogous to the population projection for the whole county. Then the county works to divide that up between the cities um, and the unincorporated areas of the county. Um, so it's more of an art 
a political art <laughs> somewhat of how that gets divided up. Um, and um, it has partly to do with buildable lands and where it's more appropriate to grow versus where it's maybe not as appropriate to grow. And so, for instance, one city might be surrounded by agri high value agricultural lands um, uh, or critical areas, and maybe that is not as appropriate area for them to grow versus some other city that has you know, low, low quality agricultural land and very few critical areas. And then that city might get more allocation. Um, and, and like, like I was saying, politics plays into it too. Some cities may say, you know, we don't want very many more <laughs> people and we don't have the services and the utilities and so forth to, to bring in large populations. We're kind of all already growing out to our boundaries and, um, abutting other cities and, and so forth. Whereas another city might say, yeah, you know, give us the, give us that population and employment and we'll expand our urban growth boundary and to, to accommodate that. Um, so that's generally kind of how it, how it works. Um, um, and so that's the, the allocation is probably more relevant to the center than the population projection, you know, low, medium or high, because it's really about the allocation really, gets to, well, how many people and how many jobs um, are we going to target to come to La Center? <clears throat> yeah. Yep. But does it become the responsibility of the city to develop that then or, or to aim for those allocations? Yes, aim is a good word for it. Plan would be another word, you know, and so then we would look at our buildable land supply and we would say, okay, do we have enough buildable land to accommodate those jobs and those people? Um, and then that would drive discussions about zoning. Okay, well, what kind of zoning do we need to accommodate those people and those, and those jobs? Um, so planning and aiming for those for those jobs and people is, is what it is. Um, the city has a limited role to play in actually developing the land versus, um, versus regulating the land and making it available for, or helping to make it available for, for development, if that makes sense. Main, primarily the public sector, sorry, the private sector drives development because they're the ones with the money. <laughs> Um, and the public sector participates in that through provision of roads, sewer, water, and those things, which kind of frame where development's going to go. Um, developers also provide roads, sewer, and water, and they're required to do that concurrent with their developments. But the, but the city collects impact fees and makes improvements to the city's utility and road systems. Um, uh, you know, that, that can also help drive where development goes. Is there, is there a value added for the city in that process? I mean, I don't know what the allocation is. Is there some advantage or some, something that would help us as a city? Uh, I'm thinking one of the, would that somehow uh, uh, drive uh, perhaps an increase in our UGA? Uh, yeah, there's a direct, there's a direct connection to the urban growth area boundary. So the more people that are allocated to the center, the more likely it is that we're going to need to expand our urban growth area boundary. Because we know that's driven by the, by the county, and they do that every so many years, not every year even. Every ten years, and we're in those, we're in that window now. So 2025 is is that. 10 year window that we're looking at from 2015, 2016, when we last updated the, the plan. Um, so yeah, that's the foundation of, of the urban growth area discussion. And we just, at this point, we just don't know where that's going to land. Right. But that would be, that would be the, the, uh, the plus for the center. It potentially, if we wanted that to be a plus, that would be one of the things that would come out of this process. Of, uh, um, 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, that that would be one way to look at it, and um, um, you know, the the obligation that comes with with expanding an urban growth area is planning for it. You know, you've got to you've got to at least apply a comprehensive plan designation to it, um, and then beyond that, you can plan as much of it as you want. Um, you can um, get into sub area planning and talking about where roads and utilities go, and then that helps attract investment. Um, but but there's also an obligation and an expense because when you expand into areas like that, then that takes money for the city to um, uh, possibly help develop some of those roads and utilities, but also to maintain them over time. So it's, you know, it's both of opportunity and obligation. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Ethan. Um, so we'll move on to the next um, Within task five, um, the population allocation will drive the housing inventory and needs assessment. Um, we had that starting right around now, but as we got more updates from the county about the timelines of this process, um, we pushed the dates back a little bit. Um, and so this reflects um, us pushing those, those dates back. And then, so we'll be starting the housing needs assessment here soon. Um, but there's um, some assumptions that we'll need based upon those allocations to complete this assessment. So we'll do what we can before then, and then once we get those um, allocation figures, we can um, finish the housing inventory needs assessment. And then um, it's looking like September or so, we'll have a draft, a uh, second draft with the PC Planning Commission, a first draft in July. Um, but note, those first and second drafts likely won't be inclusive of those allocations because we won't have them yet, but um, we'll have a pretty good idea until we can finalize it with the, the allocations. Um, and so that's it with phase one. And then phase two, task one, are the code updates, um, which we have, we've begun for family daycares and manufactured homes. That's our first batch. Um, we've revised each batch. Um, there's six batches um, to reflect how we started that with the manufactured homes and family daycares and next batch two with the critical areas ordinance. Um, and then the remaining batches, um, we've revised a bit as well to group them into like, like-minded um, code updates. So like tribal planning um, memorandum of understanding and tribal cultural resources, we group together because those are like items or um, batch for transitional permanent supportive emergency housing and group homes. We've grouped those together as well since they are um, similar items. So we, we went through the batches and made them um, where there are items that seem to kind of go together um, to go through this process. And um, there's likely code overlaps as well. So it kind of makes it more efficient as we do the code updates and can catch so things between the two. Through batch one, two, three, four, five, whatever uh, that's going to end up being. Um, are you then uh, on each of those going to be coming to us as, and saying, uh, here's, we, here's what we want to uh, share with you, and here's what we'd like is we're looking for some input, yes. uh, recommendations, direction on those things. Is that kind of how it's going to come to yeah, us? Yeah, that's how it's going to be. Um, just like how we did with the family daycares and manufactured homes, and we're going through that process, and then next month we'll go to public hearing to make a recommendation to city council, we'll be doing that with every single one of these batches. Um, so it's going to be a pretty intensive process because um, we have these batches and um, other items floating out there like uh, policy changes and um, updates to the different elements in the comprehensive plan going on too. And we're trying to um, balance that. So we're trying to get some of these like batch one, two, and maybe three out of the way before we really start digging into the policy of the comprehensive like the plan. Concept of, uh getting into bite-sized pieces. Yes. Perhaps we think they're bite sizes. <laughs> yes. Individual, but, but at least the, that's the attempt to get them. And so we're not talking about this big elephant yeah. here. We're talking about the, 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 the tusk or the tail or whatever. Yeah, and it's easier for us to track that process too yeah. and just um, easier for us to check things see. off as we go along and make sure things aren't overlooked. And it's good to, again, to go over this and with you and come through maybe some things we might be looking over. So. Yes, uh, I agree with that as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
And that's essentially it. Um, we can look at the schedule. The schedule basically, that's further down in the, this memo. Um, basically, it's just reflecting the work plan. We didn't revise anything else past this point because um, it's just adoption and um, the comp plan elements. And those, haven't, those aren't contingent upon everything else that I discussed. So we just kept everything the same as is. Um, and so the schedule um, just reflects um, these changes from the work plan. Um, so that green line kind of going through, it's hard to see um, through all the dates on the right. That's basically where we're at right now. So you can see we've uh, made, we've completed some key dates um, like the audit um, and um, some other items that like developing the work plan as well. Um, so we're, we're well into the process, but um, there's still quite a bit, bit of meat to this left. So um, yeah, the, here's the schedule. Um, let me know if you have any other questions on this. A couple questions that came into this. How do the, the milestone, the diamonds, how, how do you indicate when that milestone is completed versus the future milestone? It's a good question. The, the second point is, it looks like some of these tasks are behind. Is that a fair assessment? Um, which tasks in particular? Well, like, uh, you know, the county uh, on line six, task two. Uh, there's no progress bar that's been shown here. Sorry, what, which I can't. Oh, the county coordination meetings? Yeah, um, we've been messing around with projects. It's been a little uh, glitchy for us. I actually had it like the file blew up to like 1.6 kilobytes, so like 1.6 gigs, and I had to like do all this stuff to get the file size back down. So there's been some little glitches in the the system, um, but we are well into that process and it has begun. In like the lines 32, 33, 34, the parks plan, and the general sewer plan, and transportation plan, those all show. <laughs> I don't think so. I think what we need to do, thank you for raising this issue. There's a percent complete column that you can't see here that's hidden. So we need to go in there and update some of those so that you can see the progress on some of those. Um, you can see the progress in dark blue on some of the ones that are there, like task three right there. Yeah. So we just need to do that with some of the other ones. I don't know of a way for the milestone. I don't. I don't know of a way to to show percent completes right, on those. The milestone is not a percent complete. It's an event. Right. Event yeah. Milestone. Anyway, I just you know, if we're going to use this, I, I I like to look down and see what our progress is. That's what sure. I'm looking for. Sure. Yeah. No, we should have updated that. Thank you. Any other questions? So how are you doing on the parks plan? So Brian, parks plan. We are basically, as you mentioned earlier, just wrapping up the public involvement portion of that. So I think our schedule is um, not next month, but I think it's the month after that. So that would be June. Um, we should be coming back with sort of a, an initial draft to start getting feedback on. It might be July. I got to go back and look. But early summer, basically, we'll be starting to have a draft um, that we can start getting some input on and start having the actual body of that work um, be available for review. So, Brian, who, who on your staff is the, is, has the lead on that? Me. <laughs> Thank you. He's got a contract. Yeah. So, yeah, Steve Dew, uh, who presented the... Um, parks plan update, I guess that was two months ago now, um, is with Conservation Technics is the lead consultant on that project. So they're going to be with us through the entire program? Correct. Yeah. And how much hour, how many hours per week roughly do you think that they're spending on this? That I don't know. Uh, we could maybe tease that out of their scope and fee, um, but basically they gave us a proposal uh, to complete the entire plan over this coming year. Do you think that fairly reasonable? Yeah, it was in line with our budget. Okay. Yep. Okay, thanks. Well, if that's it, um, I guess I'll hand it over to Ethan to discuss the critical areas updates. Thank you. Good. Thanks.
Thank, Thank you. you. Good job. That's the next agenda item. Oh, so, um, yeah. Can I go back, Ali, just one more thing? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't see the, you mentioned the, all the policies in the plan. Mm -hmm. the top plan. There, I think I counted up 56 different policies. Is there a point that those are going to get some kind of systematic review? Yeah, um, it should show in the work plan, the schedule. Um, we have each element. Um, there's like, the elements are grouped a bit. Okay. There's two or three of, uh, sections of those elements, batches, I guess, and we'll go through like three or four different batches of going through the elements and the policies within them. The point them. is that all those policies that are in there, for the most part, just came from the previous plan. We, when, we, when we did the update, basically all the policies from the previous plan got put into this, the current plan. So they are, they haven't been looked at in 20 years. And so I think that warrants some systematic approach to deciding what the policies are. And I made the point to the city council, that's where they really need to be involved. And they're the policy makers. They ought to be coming to, we ought to be presenting them. Here's the policies as we see they ought to be and get their feedback. I, I agree with you. One quick reminder though, last year we did go through those policies and at least at a cursory level, remove the policies that were referencing projects that had been completed, you know, for instance, or um, for some other reason may have been out of date. We updated the policies or, or removed them. So we have had that look at them. Um, I agree with everything you're saying about going to the Planning Commission. Um, you all are the policy advisors. Planning Commission is the, pol um, sorry, City, City Council. Council is the policy makers. Um, and so what we're planning to do is in the fall, we're going to have an open house that will sort of kick off the public um, input portion of the comprehensive plan update. I mean, the public can obviously come to these meetings or connect before then if they hear about it. Um, and then following that open house, we'll have a joint workshop again with the planning commission and the city council to sort of get some initial feedback on policy on some of these bigger issues like land use and housing. Um, uh, and then as Brian said, you know, he, he's managing the parks plan update um, and there's also a sewer plan update. And so both of those will have policy components to, to them as well. So yeah, we will be opening up some of those policies. Um, I don't necessarily think we, need to feel like we have to throw the whole plan in the garbage if there's good <laughs> pieces of it. Um, and I would advise that we not do that and that we focus on the things that are the most important for updating and, and, and so forth, um, you know, to hit that deadline. Otherwise, we'll be talking about this 10 years from now. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so that's kind of how that's going to work. Appreciate it. Um, let's move on to new business and I'll hand it back to you again, Ethan, uh, 1.81. Great. Thank you. Um, and so we are starting a new topic with you tonight, which is to discuss the city's critical areas code update. Um, you remember that last month at the end of the planning commission, we had said we were going to bring the manufactured home code, um, and the family daycares code to you in a public hearing. I just wanted to acknowledge that we hadn't forgotten about that. Um, we did, however, delay that until next month to wrap up a couple of issues, including some legal review and questions that's going on um, in both of those code updates. And so our plan is to bring those to you next month um, in a public hearing. So we thought, you know, we would use the time effectively and introduce another code update to you this month. <clears throat> Um, so, you know, generally the schedule that Alec talked with you about for code updates is that, and I've mentioned this before, the first month we sort of, um, uh, you know, set you up with the conversation and the basics of the discussion. The second month we give you the first draft of the code and then the third month we come to you in a public hearing. That's, that's an aggressive schedule but we're trying to sort of aim to, to do that with, with these batches of, of code updates. 
Um, critical areas is one that I can see that will go probably a little bit longer right off the bat. Um, we're scheduling it for four months, um, um, April, May, June, July, um, but I could easily see it going five months, um, you know, and again, I'm, we'll be as efficient as we possibly can about uh, w with it, but it is um, one of those bigger um, picture topics that um, might require more discussion. Um, it's also a really important topic because um, if you think about critical areas, and I'll show some maps here in just a few minutes, but if you think about critical areas in the center, most land, most vacant land, is, you know, especially vacant developable land in the center has at least some critical areas on it. I can't remember working on any project here, actually, unless it was in downtown, you know, at the Heritage Center that didn't have a wetland or a stream or a geologic hazard on it. So it affects, um, you know, it affects people who own land and it obviously affects people's ability to develop land. Um, um, so it's a really important topic. <clears throat> Um, and so we last updated the critical areas ordinance in 2019. That was pretty recently. And I know a couple of you were on the planning commission at that point in time. I think commissioners Nut, Brock and Hill were on the planning commission. I think um, the three commissioners over here to my right were not. Do I have that right? Okay. Um, so you won't remember that. Um, but for commissioners not Brock and Hill, that seems like probably not very long ago, four years ago. So on one hand, it kind of was a long time ago, but it, it should have been updated. That critical areas ordinance update that happened in 2019 was really something that should have been tied to the city's 2016 periodic review. And then there would have been 10, you know, roughly, a little less than 10 years, but longer in between times than 2019 to 2023. It would have been 2016 to 2023, something like that. Um, so, you know, if you were wondering why we're picking this up again, if you remembered the last one, that's, that's the reason why. Um, there's a number of comprehensive plan policies that deal with critical areas, and we've listed them out there for you in this memo. Um, I'm not going to go over those very specifically, but in general, those require the city to protect critical areas in accordance with best available science. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about what best available science is later in the, in the meeting here. Um, uh, and to protect those areas, um, not only for their value to the environment, but their value to people and that includes public safety because you know for instance landslide hazard areas um, there's obvious reasons why you don't want to build in areas that are that are unsafe um, <clears throat> so as another reminder critical areas especially for the three commissioners that weren't part of the discussions four years ago there's five basic categories of critical areas, um, and this is statewide. So this terminology is starting to be standardized across the state. Um, and so the five different categories of critical areas are critical aquifer recharge areas, you know, so think drinking water, wellheads. Um, and then a second category would be fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas. Um, so that's really sort of about plants and animals at its essence. And so the two most common types of fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas in the city are streams um, and oak habitat. Um, and then frequently flooded areas. So those are your floodplains. You've heard, you've probably heard the term floodplains before. And so FEMA typically maps those and the city has um, regulations for those and so within the city of La Center and again I'll show you some maps here in a second but within the city of La Center the East Fork of the Lewis River has a floodplain on it um, but there aren't any other mapped floodplains in La Center that are associated with other creeks um, and then geologically hazardous areas that's a that's another category 
um, which is really kind of an umbrella term. Um, and within geologically hazardous areas, you have landslide hazards, seismic hazards, so think earthquakes, um, and then erosion hazards, um, you know, which you can kind of picture what erosion is, but um, wind and water erodes the soil away. Certain soils are more erodible than, than others. Um, so, Jess, if we can, um, I think it would be good to pull up the maps that are in the packet. Let me give you a page number here just so we can get a 17. sort of snapshot. Page 40. Ethan, before you go to the map, yeah. I ask you, um, looking at our uh, current code uh, on, this, uh, on this critical area, uh, are we able to map, map out those right back to the state requirements that are being levied on us? Or is that a, is that a kind of a gray area? Or is that something you have to flesh out? Or, or uh, Yeah. Um, so let me pull up. Let, let's pull up the map. So page 40 of the packet. Um, so there's, I think, four different maps, critical areas maps that the city has in, um, posted on its website. Um, and these maps are referenced into the critical areas ordinance. And I think it even says something like, you know, areas that are mapped on the city's critical areas maps are considered critical areas. <laughs> um, and so what you're seeing here are the um, critical aquifer recharge areas. So these are the areas around wellheads that are susceptible to um, um, uh, pollution, essentially. So if there's a, a land use located within those areas that's handling hazardous materials, then the city's critical aquifer recharge area ordinance would kick in and require that they do analysis. And that would sort of result in them having some mitigations, you know, how they store those chemicals, um, how they handle and store those chemicals, um, for instance. Or it might even say, hey, you can't do this inside here because it's a highly sensitive area. And if something happened, you would contaminate the city's water, ply, uh, water supply or the public water supply. So anyways, sorry, sidetracked a little bit. But getting to your question, yes, we can map these um, different types of critical areas, but it's based upon um, available data that's out there and the it's it's desktop analysis it's not field verified so um, to a greater or lesser degree that applies to all of these critical areas maps that i'm talking about um, and so what it really becomes is kind of an indicator that there's a critical area there um, and then that triggers somebody to go out and, and um, need to complete a critical areas report and file it um, uh, with the city if they're going to propose development in those areas. And then that critical areas report, you know, is a field verified document that says that that talks about whether or not that critical area is actually there and what that development has to do to protect it. Um, so that's generally how that works. It's the maps you see are a desktop analysis of where these critical areas are located at. So this is your aquifer recharge area map. So let's maybe go to the next map. <clears throat> Here's your frequently flooded areas. So this is essentially your 100 year floodplain in the center. And again, that's following the East Fork of the Lewis River there. And you can see it's fairly big where you have, um, where you have floodplain ad adjacent um, you know, in the low center bottoms and so forth, there's a pretty big floodplain there. But there's also not a lot of development um, in those areas. <clears throat> so that's your, those are your frequently flooded areas. And we're going to be updating these maps as part of this project, by the way. We're going to make these current and more useful. Desktop analysis. With desktop analysis. Because, you know, we can't go out and field verify <laughs> the entire city, but um, okay. So here are your geologically hazardous areas, um, and there's those three categories that are kind of built in that I mentioned: landslide hazards, seismic hazards, and erosion hazards. This 
particular map doesn't distinguish between those. It's just kind of lumps them all together as geologic hazards. Um, uh, let's go to the next map. It doesn't look very friendly to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, center has lots of critical areas. Oh um, okay, and here's your wetlands. And these, you know, a lot of these overlap with the floodplains, right? Because those are low-lying areas. That's where water drains. And so you've got a lot of floodplains down there by the river. Um, that's sort of generally where they're located at. And then a scattering elsewhere. Um, so my point in showing you this is, you know, number one, just to kind of give you an idea of how these are ge geographically distributed. I mean, the first thing you should think when you think critical areas is think water, because that's where a lot of these are located at, right? Next to streams and rivers, you're going to get steeper slopes. <laughs> you're going to get, um, a lot of times you're going to get aquifer recharge areas. You're going to get floodplains, and you're going to get habitat, animals and plants that are unique to to those areas um, and then there's like as I said there's scattered critical areas elsewhere but if you had to pick one area where critical areas are concentrated it's next to it's next to water bodies <clears throat> you don't have a map for the uh, fish and wildlife habitat areas yeah and I don't know why that is but we're going to create one um, for as part of this project. These are just the city's adopted critical areas maps, and I don't know why they didn't choose to Who make. Who provides that to you? What's that? Who will provide oh, that to you? That's somebody else in WSP. Um, so we have um, GIS analysts, geographic information systems, and they pull all of this data into maps, um, and they've done it for other projects and all of that that we've worked on. And so. Um, but the base data comes from who? Oh. Um, it depends on which critical area you're talking about. So, for instance, if you're talking about fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas, those are the streams and the oak habitat. There's other categories too, but for simplification purposes, streams and oak habitat, that data comes from WDFW, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Okay. For critical aquifer recharge areas, it's a combination of Clark County wellhead data and wellhead information from the Washington Department of Health because they permit new wells. And they, and they feed that into the GIS then? Yeah. And then you guys massage it and pull it out of there? And yep. Essentially. Make, make I mean, out of it. Okay. We, yeah. we don't massage as, so much as we... What's that? Oh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I, th I thought I heard you guys saying five minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, uh, so we don't massage it or manipulate it so much as we display it right. in a way that we hope you will understand. But um, the data is kind of the data. We're not changing the data. We're just sh showing it in different ways, basically. And that's, and that's important because there's obviously different ways you can present that. Yeah. So, uh, right. Thank you. So question how these maps are used. When somebody comes in with a, wants to develop something, does somebody in the city go to each of these maps and say, oh, you're in a red area, you need to go do something? Is that the way these are used? Yeah, kind of, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the ordinance, as I said, it adopts these maps into it, but that's not a good idea. <laughs> and we'll talk about that later because, number one, these are not areas that are set in stone. They're not field verified. So we use these maps, but we also use many other data sources that are that some of which are also listed in the city's critical areas ordinance to figure out where critical areas are um, or could be. That's probably a better way to put it. Um, uh, because some of those data sources just simply aren't reflected on these maps, but yet the city is obligated to regulate those areas. So that's one of the updates that's going to happen to these maps. We're going to bring additional data, more current data into them. So, so these maps here would not be part of the presentation uh, by our um, Chamber of Commerce and to protect, uh, protect uh, prospective uh, builders and developers, correct? Well, they should, they there's, that package. yeah, that's a big, <laughs> policy discussion that we should probably have because critical areas definitely do impact
the amount of developable land that people have, but there's things that you can do to um, to offset that. You know, for instance, we in the critical areas ordinance already we have what's called a density transfer that allows people to take density that's located in these critical areas and transfer it to the buildable portion of the site to, to some degree. It's very imperfect, <laughs> and we'll talk about that later. It's primarily for the low density residential zone, and you can't transfer in the um, medium density residential zone, not, not critical areas anyways. There is a density transfer there, but it's only for low density resident, for, for perimeter areas. Anyways, we'll get into that some more because I think that's one thing that needs to probably be addressed and perhaps fixed for the city. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to jump back to um, some of my notes here, maybe skipping around a little bit. Um, so I think one of the points you want to take from this discussion as well is that the city is obligated, mandated really, um, to protect these critical areas under state law, you know, and there's, there's that obligation comes from the Growth Management Act, um, which is the primary planning um, law, I guess, if you will, um, uh, from the state. And then there's various guidance, other guidance um, from the state. Some of that is contained in, contained in the different WACs. Um, um, and other guidance are official publications that come out from the state, some of which we'll talk about um, tonight and in future future months. Um, so um, we have attached to sorry <laughs> to the planning commission packet for you tonight what's called the critical areas checklist. I'm not going to go through it only at a very high level. You can look at it um, if you want. But we've sort of identified the areas of the center's critical areas ordinance that needs updating. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about sort of each of these, a little bit more about each of these critical areas and, and what their functions are, why, why the state says that we should preserve them, and why, you know, we probably at the end of the day think that they should be preserved as well. And so let's talk about wetlands a little bit. I think everybody has a general idea of what wetlands are. There's a lot of different varieties of wetlands and different qualities of wetlands. Um, and generally those are categorized into four different categories, category one, two, three, and four. And that's a system that's used again statewide um, for the most part. And category one are the highest quality wetlands. That's like the center bottoms down here where you see standing water most of the year. Um, but then there's other types of wetlands where, um, you know, there's wet soil and wet plants, but you're not going to walk across standing water. A lot of La Center has those types of wetlands, and those are lower quality, usually category three or four wetlands. And you'll see those in, in fields where there's an area of, of, you know, drainage, a depression, or something like that. Um, uh, and so what the science says about wetlands is that they provide different functions. First, they remove sediments and excess nutrients from runoff, um, as well as toxics. They prov help provide a microclimate, which means they help reduce the temperature near them and, and within the city, um, and they provide habitat. Um, and the science says that wetlands can be protected by placing a buffer around them and that's usually a vegetated buffer with native vegetation in it and then that helps filter out the runoff um, going going into the wetland and it also helps provide habitat um, around that wetland. Um, generally speaking those buffers are related to the quality of the wetlands so the higher quality wetlands are going to have larger buffers and the lower quality wetlands are going to have smaller buffer. So that's how that works. We're going to get into the specifics of buffers um, possibly next month or the month after. The state has a new system. I, let me take that. It's not really a new system, but they've updated their, their wetland buffer recommendations. And so the city is now obligated to update its code to comply with that. And there's different ways that 
that the city um, can regulate those. You can be more flexible um, or you can be less flexible. And there's advantages and disadvantages to each. If you're, if you're more flexible, um, it requires people to do more work to demonstrate that more field work, for instance, to demonstrate um, you know, what type of wetland they have and, and what the values of that wetland are. If you're less flexible, um, people don't have to submit as much documentation, but they might have a larger buffer than they would otherwise. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in so coming months. Is, is it, my assumption is that the new buffer rules means the buffers are getting larger? In the case of um, not necessarily. In some cases, they might get smaller, and that's kind of that that those systems that we're going to talk, or, or those different approaches that we're going to talk about, um, where if you if the city were to choose to be more flexible, which would require more applicant work to to plug into that system, people might actually get a smaller buffer in that system because that system is more specific to the type of development. Um, and the type of wetland that you have versus being sort of more general. <clears throat> so that's kind of one of the trade-offs that we're going to talk about. Um, so let's talk a little bit about fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas. And again, those are primarily in the center streams. Um, and um, the buffers around streams. And the buffers around streams are called um, and I don't know why they use different terminology, but they do. The buffers around streams are called riparian habitat areas um, versus the buffers around wetlands, which are called buffers. So, but they're really both types of buffers, and they have some similar qualities. Um, you know, they share similar functions and qualities as as wetlands. And so, riparian buffers um, again help um, with water quality. They stabilize stream banks. Um, they help maintain those microclimates. So again, keeping temperatures down within the city. Um, uh, they help filter nutrients and other inputs, and they help with flood control as well. And you saw that on the, the floodplain map. Those are also riparian areas adjacent to streams. You know, if the city flood, if if the river floods, then those are areas that can accommodate flooding. Um, you know, which is a you know, a good reason not to develop in them. Um, and just kind of a quick factoid about riparian areas, 85% of the species in Washington use riparian areas for habitat, you know, because they go down to the water, they live near the water, they forage near the water. Um, so those are areas that are rich in habitat and, and plant life. <clears throat> um, so let's talk a little bit more about riparian areas. Um, the city has, city's existing system um, for riparian areas is based on stream classification. So there's different types of streams. So sort of the lowest level of stream is a type N stream, which stands for non-fish bearing. Um, and those streams are gonna have the narrowest buffer applied to them. The city's current code says that, or would apply a buffer of between 75 and 150 feet for those those types of streams. Then you go up one rung to a type F stream. That's a fish bearing stream. So that would be Jenny Creek, McCormick Creek, Bolin Creek. Um, I might be missing one. Bre Breezy Creek. Um, <clears throat> And the city's code says that those have to have a buffer that's 200 feet wide. Um, and then the top rung is what's called a type S stream. And that's a shoreline of the state. That's regulated under the city shoreline master program and its critical areas ordinance. But the only type S stream in the center is the East Fork of the Lewis River. Um, and those have a 250 foot buffer on them. Um, so just kind of keep those numbers in mind as we talk about this. But, and you know, the range you want to keep in mind is 75 to 250 feet. Go ahead. Is that on either, on either side? Of yes, the, either side. Uh, yep. It's not a combination. Correct. It's not, okay. It's, yep. Okay. 75 feet on, or 200 feet, whatever it is on either side of the stream. Side, okay. So 
I think I've mentioned this in prior months and maybe the first time back in maybe like November that the city has, um, sorry, not the city, the state has come up with new guidance even since 2019 about riparian areas and how, what the science is behind them and how they think that cities and jurisdictions across the state should regulate these. Um, so that system that I just described to you of stream classifications, which has been around for decades, it originated with forest practices applications, um, I don't know how long ago, but um, is, is going away as far as, as far as critical areas are concerned. And so now what the state is recommending, and this, by the state I mean WDFW, um, is recommending that um, we do is to um, look at something, a, a system that they call site potential tree height. And basically what that is, is you take the largest potential tree height um, growing next to the stream, na native tree, usually a conifer, you know, like a dug fir or something like that, that's 200 years old and the height of that tree defines the riparian area now instead of these fixed distances that I'm talking about. And the state has a map of these site potential tree heights. Um, an example of this, we, we put an example of this in your planning commission packet, Whoops. page 17. Um, this is along Breezy Creek, and so they've gone and mapped all the streams throughout the state and um, the, site, the site potential tree height. Um, and so that blue line that you see there next to Breezy Creek is um, the line that they're showing. Do we have the feet shown on there? I can't read. 225. 225. So in that particular reach of Breezy Creek, they're saying that it should have a 225-foot buffer on it because they're saying that a mature tree could grow to 225 feet in that area based upon the soil type. That's the other connection to this, based upon the soil type. <laughs> now, I was, I was having a hard time understanding this line. So I see the dark blue. I assume that's the creek? Um, I think that's the inner buffer line. I'm I'm reading that, and the the stream would actually be between those two narrowest lines. So the I light, think the light blue is the 250 foot buffer then. Uh, the 220, yeah, the 225 foot buffer. So um, the city's going to have to consider how to implement this, and this is happening across the state. Now, I think Washougal was one of the first jurisdictions to do this, and WSP helped them out with this, and they moved toward this system, but not all the way. <laughs> so we're going to be talking to you about the different options that the city will have, completely implementing this exactly as the state wants us to do it, or... Um, or some sort of a hybrid system that moves the, the city towards this system and away from the old system. Clark County, I think, has a hybrid system now, and they just updated their critical areas ordinance, and so they use the old stream classification, type N, type F, type S, but they move towards this system by adjusting their buffers to sort of account for site potential so, so tree the height. States, the state's plan, any, any stream, regardless of its current classification, gets a 225-foot 200, buffer. And they have a three-foot. Yeah. See, I, I, I have a real problem with that. And my question is, is how are we going to let property owners know that this is occurring? Because this will have a significant impact on their ability to develop property. You know, out in the area I live, we've got an NS stream uh, that has a 75-foot uh, buffer on it that impacted one lot. And the homeowner had to put his house in a non-optimum position. If if we went to 225 feet, there'd be no building on that, that lot, 
and would impact the adjacent lot. And this NS stream, supposedly, is a eight, eight or 10 inch conduit running underground. It makes, no, well, it's open, it's open for the outflow from our stormwater pond is the only open area and it's about maybe 30 feet long. And so, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. And so my point is, is we ought to be somehow letting property owners know that they're going to be impacted. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And we're obligated to, to do that and ask them to, you know, open up opportunities for them to come comment. Um, so I think what we can do is perhaps do some GIS analysis to figure out who those property owners are and notify them that we're considering this and invite them to come to um, the planning commission meetings. Um, but the other sort of piece of this is that um, as part of the best available science, you can do a site specific report and say, this is what the stream is like. It's piped, it's not even open. Um, and here's what the functions and values of that stream are. So do a site-specific critical area study, and that might allow a property owner to reduce this buffer. There's already buffer reductions available in the city's existing critical areas ordinance of 25%, so that would help some. Um, and then there's also critical areas variances. And so this isn't going to completely prevent somebody from developing their property because there's, there's variances and there's what's called a reasonable use exception. And a reasonable use exception is when a critical area would otherwise completely prevent development on somebody's property. Then they use that to say, look, I'll, that's essentially a government taking. <laughs> you can't tell me I can't do anything with my property. So um, we have those reasonable use exceptions that somebody can apply for when something like that happens. Um, and then I just want to bring, bring us back to a comment I made earlier about um, density transfers, because that's another part of this formula is, you know, on, on raw land where somebody, a developer is going to put some new housing, <clears throat> um, a density transfer would allow them to transfer the number of units they would normally be able to build in these critical areas but can't transfer those to the buildable portion of the site um, and therefore you know reduce lot sizes um, increase densities on that buildable portion of the site but also um, maintain the ability to develop to develop their land potentially at the densities that they they could have you know if there was no critical area on it. <clears throat> so that's a trade-off that that we should think about. I would, you know, advocate that that the city should definitely be doing that and it already is to to some degree. Um, but in some cases it's made certain development, the city's existing code has made certain development impossible. Um, we had a pre-application meeting for something called the Center Heights roughly a year or a few months ago, a year and a few months ago up here in Tim and Landing. And they have so much, so many critical areas there. And the way the city's code is written now, um, that that developer got frustrated and walked because they couldn't make that style of development work on that site. Um, so we have to have those kind of difficult discussions as part of this to say, you know, do we want that type of development? Should people, people be able to do that here? And if so, what do we need to do to our regulations to allow that to happen? <clears throat> Ethan, <clears throat> these decisions regarding this critical areas and such, are those decisions that, are, uh, that we can make within the city or do we have to get, if the state somehow gets involved in this and has to sign off on or uh, approve our recommendation or whatever or, uh, or do we have to are we kind of beholden to the state still that they have to somehow say yay verily we agree with you that the state doesn't have any sign-off authority in updating the critical areas ordinance but 
the city is obligated to update its critical areas ordinance in accordance with best available science, which the state helps define. <laughs> so at the end of the day, the city can choose to update its critical areas ordinance in a way that it determines meets best available science. And there's different varieties of that around the state. And you look at different critical areas ordinances and some apply a 150 foot buffer and some apply a 50 foot buffer, some apply a 25 foot buffer, some you'll see that ac variation across the state. Um, my job is to advise you what that best available science says and what I think that the city is obligated to do. And then your job is to look at that and ask what else could be done? Could we do this instead? Those type of questions. So the last piece in answering your question though is that um, there's different interest groups involved in in this code update in every code update right there's the property owners and the developers um, that generally speaking want want as much developable land as possible right to maximize the amount of um, development that they can put on their property and then there's um, then there's existing citizens um, in the center that perhaps want some of these green um, areas around streams to be preserved and not to have them filled over. Um, I'm, I'm making general, I'm generalizing here. Um, uh, you know, and then there's environmentalists. My point is that, that we may not sit here, we're sitting here looking at an empty room tonight, but you, don't, you never know who is tracking these things. And, and we should be inviting people into this, into this process, right? Um, and so at the end of the day, I don't, I think that the recommendation that, one of the recommendations that we're gonna make is that the city um, define, move as close to best available science as it can um, and define what that is. And then in instances where we're not meeting, where the city's not gonna meet best available science state, what that is, why it is, what the reasons were that that we chose not to do that. So you can weigh other factors in this, economic um, factors, social factors, um, all of those types of things. Um, because if the city is ever challenged, it has to have that record in, in place. Okay, so we come up with this decision on the, uh far as the uh, setback or what do you, what do you, what's the word? Thing? Buffer. Buffer. <clears throat> and then we have a, a developer comes in and says, okay, I think I've got a, I've got a, uh, an exception to that. I'd like to uh, approach you with uh, doing the following. <clears throat> we got the, the codes in place and everything, inside, but we've got now developer says, I'd like to present with you a, a proposal that I think will still meet, you know, meet the, the letter, but we need to do it a little bit differently than what uh, the, the code calls for. If, are we going to be in a position to work with that developer potentially, and and try to help him through this process, or are we going to say, hey, that's that's the that's that's the law, um, or are we? Uh, and if we do say we'll work with you. Does that mean we also have to bring in the state piece, looking over our shoulder as we work with this developer potentially to maybe make an exception to the rules, so to speak? We need to build those flexibilities into our code because at the end of the day, the city is obligated to follow its code. So that's why, import that's why it's important to have that flexibility already there so when the developer comes to us, we have the ability to um, look at unique circumstances and say, this is appropriate to do this differently in this case because, um, so that that's that's the way to handle that is to build the flexibility. I think that's, I think that's important. Yeah. I, I, you know, and I think that's, I, should, I think city council would also think that that's important. Mm -hmm. One of previous discussions with them on other things. 
that that that's that they would want would want us to be proactive in trying and so if we put that proactivity opportunity in our code then we we have something to work with yeah and, and so that's that's important then we put that together in a way that it does give us the flexibility so to speak if, we, if that's the right term or not mm -hmm. uh, to do some things uh, based on a particular uh, scenario for a particular piece of property mm -hmm. okay thank you thank you okay try and wind it down here so we don't let's see if i can get my computer to work uh oh i still won't see the screen <laughs> <laughs> i think i lost power here um, I think it's saved on my desktop. Let me see if I can. I think I'll just have to operate by memory. <laughs> so we were talking about wetlands. We were talking about fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas. Those are the two major types of critical areas that we wanted to talk with you about tonight. In future months, we'll talk to you about geologically hazardous areas, critical aquifer recharge areas, um, and frequently flooded areas. Um, if you look at the list of code changes that we need to make to the critical areas ordinance, it's attached to um, it's attached to the memo in your packet, and um, it's pretty long. But there's a lot of very small issues, changing definitions to be consistent with you know state law, that type of stuff. A lot of little things we're going to fix. But some of the bigger issues are the ones that I've already talked about. Um, updating the city's critical areas maps, updating the stream riparian area buffers, um, you know, to move us towards that best available science, updating the city's wetland buffers, again, to move us towards the current best available science um, on that, addressing the city's density transfer provisions to allow more flexibility there. Those are the big issues that we're going to be fixing or, or talking about with this with this code update. Um, and I just wanted to highlight those for you um, as opposed to a lot of the little small issues um, that are listed out there too. So I'll wrap it up with that. Um, if you have any other questions or comments, please let me know. Um, and we will do our best to um, bring you the best information that we can, answer your questions. I'm planning on making our one of our natural resource scientists, Dusty Day, available. He was involved in the 2019 update, so he may attend next month or the month after that, and he has um, a lot of experience in the field. Um, working with wetlands and, and stream habitat areas. And, and um, he's helped me with other code updates before too. And so we want to bring that sort of hands-on experience to you. And you can, you know, if you have very detailed technical questions, I think he can help answer some of those as well. Um, so um, any other questions? <laughs> this is going to be a hot button. <laughs> If the public catches wind, it's going to be a hot button. What's that? If the public catches wind, this is going to be a hot button, I think. Just so, as an example, if you go to something like page 32 of 45 or something, I, I just want to see. You, you look like you've listed a lot of those things, but it also in the, you have a column that you have marks things uh, do. Uh, do you designate the waters? I mean, it looks like you have a lot of yeses, basically, yes, uh, yes. already marked. So that is that saying our codes are okay with that area? Yes. And then, yeah. and then at certain ones of them, you'll have something that says we need to look at this one. Yes. Okay. That's exactly you're interpreting that, sure right? I was reading that correctly. Yeah. Okay. So if it has a yes, we're good to go, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ethan. Until the science gets updated again. Yeah, until the best available <laughs> science is otherwise. So yeah. All right. Are we ready to move on to 1.9? Um, let's go ahead and move on to the uh, community development staff report. 
I'm not sure if it's Ethan or Alec um, presenting that. Or Brian. Or Brian. I get to do it tomorrow, so. Okay. <laughs> I can um, present here. I'm going to read off Jess's screen. Um, okay, let's keep, sorry, keep scrolling down, Jess. Um, so Valley View subdivision that received preliminary plat approval um, going by memory here last summer or fall approximately. Um, and they're coming back with engineering plans now. So we're going through engineering plan review with them. What was uh, the uh, outcome on the barn? Oh, um, so we applied a, a SEPA mitigation measure requiring them to file additional documentation about whether that barn is significant or not. Um, they subsequently filed a letter from an architectural historian saying that it's not. So that was kind of the end of the issue at that point. Okay, let's see. Advanced builders, which number is that on the map? 51. 51. Um, that's a fourplex. I think we've spoken with you about that before. They filed an application and that has not been deemed complete yet. We've gone through a couple of rounds of incompleteness with them. Um, so that's the ball still in their court on that one. <clears throat> Stevens Hillside Farm, there's kind of a trio of applications there. I think we've talked about that one too. There's a development agreement. There's a variance um, for lot setbacks. And then there's a final plat application. And we're reviewing all of those um, simultaneously. Um, the development agreement would increase the allowed lot coverage on a certain number of lots within that development to essentially provide single story homes. The variance would allow for reduced setbacks, front setbacks along the street on approximately 60 odd, 61 lots within that development. Um, and the, tr but not the garage, that's an important point. So it would be the living area that's closer to the, to the sidewalk. Um, and which and number again was that? 61. 61. Oh, sorry, the number on the map, 13. 13. Ethan, side. it appears to me that what has happened here, we have a, uh, they've chosen the, um, they've chosen the road of, asking for forgiveness rather than dealing with this at front or front. In other words, we approved what they're going to do, but now they're saying, eh, however, we need to have these variances in order to make it work. Uh, I, we can't stop the train probably at this point, and I don't think I want to anyway, but I really struggle with the fact that they know, they knew going in what the standards are, what our code called for. But they went ahead and we went ahead and said, yay, barely press on. And now they're coming to us going, yeah, but we need in order for this to really work properly, we need to have less setback and this and that and so on. And it just seems like, you know, they've chosen the, asking for a forgiveness routine rather than dealing with it up front. I, I struggle with that. I, I don't think that's a good way to run the business in the city, personally. I, I'm, glad with their, I'm glad they're here. I'm glad they're building. But they, they knew up front what, what should have been done properly. Maybe that meant they were going to have X number of less lots. I don't know what that all means for sure. But the fact that we're they're probably going to get this all approved. Are they? Probably. More than likely at this stage. 
I mean, if they can demonstrate that they're meeting the code, the city would be obligated to approve that. And remember, there's a variance code to allow developers some flexibility in certain situations. So the case that they're making is that they have a product, single story homes, that is becoming more popular. If you look at the variance criteria that talks about that there's something, um, there's a special circumstance that pertains to the site or the use that is proposed. So they'll have to meet the variance criteria. The trade-off for that is that they have to provide additional amenities with that within that development, including um, additional open space, um, additional trails, um, and things like that. Additional architectural amenities on these houses that are going to be that are going to be closer. So that's that's what we've discussed with them. Um, and I think that the point that you're making is, is well taken. Um, and I think it's probably something that we should probably visit about separately to, to be honest with you. I mean, we don't want have anything to hide, but I understand what you're. I understand. I guess two, two comments on that. Um, if you look at their plat map, I mean, they, they say they need this for their single story houses, uh, but they're certainly not putting by their plat map, putting 61 single family homes up there or single story homes, excuse me. Uh, they're applying the, the setback to their multi-story homes also. Um, and the secondly, the, the amenities they're offering are just land that they can't use anyway. So it's really no, they're not giving up anything to get the benefit that they want. Um, so I, I agree with Dennis, you know, we got ourselves in the same kind of bind at Riverside. There's things out there that happened that were blatantly against the code, uh, but it was just too far along and nobody wanted to risk a lawsuit is what it boiled down to. And I think we need to be doing a better job up front of understanding what the developer is going to do. I mean, they could have put up, you know, higher retaining walls to get flatter lots up there if they wanted. Um, so they wouldn't have that problem, but they elected not to. Okay, thank you. Brian, does that make sense? I mean, this is, this is, this is in your, your, your. Yeah, I mean, I, I do see your point, but I think, you know, ultimately, as Ethan said, there's a, there's a give and take to these developer agreements and it's actually codified that there is a give and take, you know, there, we're not allowed to just, you know, give away the farm without getting something in return. And what we've negotiated in this case is, as he said, higher architectural standards, you know, this is, uh, New Tradition Homes um, is the builder that acquired this and came to us. I don't think they were the applicant. I think they purchased this property or this development um, after the post-decision review. So to say that they, as the as New Traditions, as the builder in there, knew what they were getting into. I mean, I guess they knew what the approval that they were buying was, but they approached the city and said, hey, is there a way, you know, we basically they're trying to build these single family story or single story, single family homes because, you know, it, it helps, it's popular with, uh, for aging in place and, you know, it allows better opportunities for, you know, um, the, an aging population is really what it came down to. Um, so we said, okay, um, here's, you know, the reason that we have these lot coverage standards, which is so that there's adequate recreation areas, you know, in your backyard, essentially. And to be frank, we have quite a bit lower uh, lot coverage standards than any other jurisdiction in the county. I think we're at 35% and typically, you know, we've, we've done some looking around in other jurisdictions or 50 or higher for single family, you know, similar density properties. So, um, you know, it's not like we're going way out on a limb here and, you know, saying that they can cover the whole lot. Um, so again, it was a, you know, it was a discussion. It was a collaborative process. Ultimately, it's the city council's decision to approve the, um, not the variance necessarily, because the season says there's criteria for that, um, but for the development agreement, um, there, that is the city council's purview to, you know, to review and approve that. So why wasn't the variance included in the developer's agreement? 
Right. You can't, there's only certain things that you can modify in a development agreement and that's not one of them. So they could have, they could have filed a variance on their own for these 61 lots and said, um, okay, here's, you know, we want to reduce the setbacks and, and increase the lot coverage. Um, and here's how we meet that. But we said, well, okay, because of the number of lots you're talking about here, the city wants something in return for this. We want additional open space. We want additional trail connections. We want a higher quality of architecture on the fronts of these buildings because otherwise the city wouldn't have gotten anything um, from this um, in return. And so that's kind of why we coupled it with a development agreement. But you couldn't, you couldn't, there's only certain things you can modify in a development agreement. Lot coverage is one, but setbacks is is not one. So they couldn't. <clears throat> I guess the problem with that is um, it's a type two review. And so the city council never hits a vote on that. Mm -hmm. and on the variance. The, huh? On the variance? Yeah, on the variance, yeah. And I, you know, I think that is, in my mind, the setbacks are more important to the aesthetics of the community rather than the impervious surface and you're not the city council isn't getting a, a say in that and I think that's a problem but if I'm recalling correctly the variance um, was largely due to irregularly shaped lots and and similar so it's not like for example there they have a bunch of rectangular lots and they're going from a 10 foot setback to a five foot setback they're encroaching in that what would be the traditional setback area, but maybe it's just the corner of the house or something um, on these lots that aren't exactly the same shape as the house. You know, you could fit the same footprint of house if you designed a custom house that was shaped to that specific lot, but, you know, builders have standard sets of plans um, and they're not doing custom homes for each lot. So, um, again, that's maybe that's splitting hairs, but that's kind of well, the thinking there. I know today was the deadline for comments on the, the developer's agreement, but I'm surprised the developer's agreement, you're basically saying in the agreement that the setbacks can be whatever's approved with the individual permits, as opposed to saying, here is the here is your new standard. Um, I'm not sure if I'm following that in the, in the or not. Agreement, there's a table that says, it shows here's what the, the code standard is for all the setbacks and what they're proposing is as permitted. Right. That's because it's permitted under the, or would be permitted under the variance. But, but you're, but the development agreement isn't saying what that variance is. Because it be can't per code. The, I know, yeah, again, I guess, this. I see a trade wreck coming like we got out of Riverside, is my whole point. Is you're, you're giving, giving the developer way too much leeway. And I can understand where you might say, okay, 10 foot is the minimum you can do by this variant. But you're not doing that. You're saying whatever is approved at, at the time of an individual permit for an individual house. I don't think that's what we're saying, but I, I think. It's a good point because I think what we should say in the development agreement as a, as approved by variance is probably what we should say, but we can't go beyond that and specify what the reduced setbacks are in the development agreement because again, the development agreement code doesn't allow us to do that. It, it would have been ideal, I think, your what, point's what taken to be so, able to so lump it all together in one agreement, however. What, our, is, what does the variance allow you to do then? It allows you to vary from the code set back by a certain percentage. I'm going to suggest that we, maybe we add this to an upcoming agenda under new business to discuss this. So well, I, I think these sort of comments might be best addressed, one, through public comment. You know, right. there's a whole process for this and commissioners or citizens, they're welcome to make a public comment. Yeah, um, they're of, also welcome to reach out to staff, but I would agree that a public meeting on the record is not an appropriate time to discuss these items. Okay. Yeah, so noted. Just an observation. Yeah, yeah. I was going to uh, punt this to a, a new agenda item um, if, if we wanted to discuss like this type of code in general. But um, but thank you though. It's it, it's interesting to hear these discussions for a person like myself who's newer. But um, are, are you guys good with the community development staff report? Um, if you are, we are. There are a couple more items we could touch on if you're interested, like the Lockwood Meadows 
Like to hear Subdivision. Sure, what's happening there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they have filed a critical areas report and a tree removal permit because they did not do that concurrent with their development, and so they were conditioned that they didn't do that concurrent with their preliminary plat, so they were conditioned to do it um, later. And um, so those were just deemed complete yesterday or today. Um, and well, actually a couple of days ago, and we sent notice out today of those. Um, so they have so the approval of the tree cutting in the... They haven't gotten it yet. Oh, they have not gotten it. Have not gotten it yet. The critical areas permit is for impacts to an oak buffer that's kind of located at the far southeast side of the site adjacent to Lockwood Creek Road. And so they're, as part of that application, they're required to um, uh, build Lockwood Creek Road, um, ex, you know, ex, uh, dedicate right away and build that to a certain standard. And that's going to impact the buffer of that oak tree, only really a little bit, sort of the outer edges of that oak tree buffer. Um, so that's what's happening there. And then they're removing um, 61, do you remember off the top of uh, Trees, 60 something trees, I think, on that site. And then they're going to mitigate for that by planting trees within the subdivision, primarily along the streets. Um, so I th think that's. It. Did I miss anything? Okay. I got a question regarding the the um, <clears throat> the property that's across the street from the minute uh, management, uh, the uh, brush rock crutching business there. Mm -hmm. um, where are we at on that? Is that uh, is that? They've had a pre-application meeting. You're talking about a proposed hotel. They had a pre-application meeting um, that was probably a month or more ago, two months maybe, and um, I haven't heard anything else okay. since so then. So nothing. we're assuming at this point that they're redrawing their plans or drawing up their plans and getting ready to submit something. Um, you saw some preliminary plans, correct? Those, yeah, there was some concept plans that were contained in the pre-application file okay. that I think is available on the city's website. It, it but, is, yeah. yes. Yeah. And so those, did those, some of, did we kind of put thumbs down on part of that or threw them back to the drawing board or something? Or? Um, so that area is located in the junction plan. And so the, the basic sort of, one of the basic requirements of the junction plan zone is that you front buildings on the street. And they didn't want to do that. They want their building to be located in the, on the back of that site, which is the southern side of that site with the parking lot up front. Um, and so we talked to them about that requirement. And so that's one of the things they're, you know, sort of mulling over with, with their plan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ethan. I appreciate that. Yep. Um, let's move on to uh, planning commissioner and alternate comment. And I'm going to do it in reverse. Uh, uh, commissioner Paul, any comments? No. Commissioner Keeler? I have no comments. Commissioner Hill? Um, I'm good. Thank you. And Commissioner Nuprock? Um, back, to the, back to the development agreement, but a different subject entirely. I noticed that the, the park area is still being calculated different than what this planning commission intended. We've talked about this before, and I understand how the words can be interpreted that way. Um, I think we need to fix oh, that Oh, in the quickly. code you're talking about? Yeah. That, that okay. needs to be fixed quickly. Mm -hmm. And I'd be happy to help you with that or show you what the rationale we had. But it's, it's clear to me that the, that it's not being, in, it's probably being interpreted the way the words say, but it's not the intent that the Planning Commission had when we implemented that park scope. Okay, yeah. So I don't know if you were around that. Okay. And I don't know if the other commissioners know what <laughs> we're talking about. It turns out in that the, they are providing more than enough 
park area per the intent that we had but the interpretation is is not what we intended who's who's they which application you're talking about Stevens Hillside oh okay yeah so the issue is that the parks code says that residential developments of certain number of units are required to provide 0.25 acres of park per that number of units so for T for LDR developments it's per 35 units you have to provide a quarter acre for MDR developments you have for you have to provide a quarter acre wait maybe I have this switch sorry for LDR it's for every 45 units you have to provide a quarter acre for MDR for every 35 units you have to provide a quarter acre of park and then there's a statement in the code that says and that's calculated after the first 35 units or 45 units threshold so we've read that and interpreted that okay for the first 35 units or the first 45 units depending on if you're talking about LDR MDR you don't have to provide park space and then beyond that you have to provide that ratio a quarter acre per 35 or 45 in talking with Dennis Commissioner not Brock he said that's not what was intended by the Planning Commission that that the park space requirement was intended to apply to all of the units not the right not the amount after that like the the code seems to say so he's suggesting that we fix that and that they you know so effectively that would require that they provide twice the amount of park space for that for that you know for those first number of units and I agree if that's your intent then then that should probably be fixed and I can show you the presentations that we had here and we had for the City Council to show you that was clear the intent of the code mm-hmm so maybe we can add that to our to-do list of code mm-hmm. updates um, all right uh, moving on to 1.12 um, appreciate you guys tolerating my texts every month um, and appreciate you guys getting back to me that we just use that to establish uh, whether we're gonna have a quorum or not and um, I would at this time entertain a motion to adjourn I shall move all right we have a motion in a second any discussion hearing new discussion all those in favor please say aye aye Aye. any any objections anyone abstaining all right we are adjourned thank you guys